And good morning, everyone. Welcome both here in the walls of the sanctuary and also beyond, wherever you are in this cold, beautiful Seattle morning. Please take a moment and we'll pray together before we look at the life of David. Father, thank you that uh, we have the freedom to gather and listen for your voice and allow you to speak to us through words, but more significantly through the ministry of your Holy Spirit in each of our hearts, taking uh, what is spoken and applying it in our lives, both individually and collectively. We invite your Spirit now to speak to us. We gather here uh, from many settings and contexts, both uh, collectively and personally, and know that you can speak to us and shape us that we might be people of hope in our world, and we'll thank you for that. We pray in Christ's name, amen. Well, as we enter into this new year, you know, uh, when I turn the news on, on uh, TV in the evenings, I hear it over and over again, 2024, a year unlike any other, to the point of it's a a very depressing message, actually, because what I'm hearing over and over again is uh, that we're in the midst of a deeply divided culture and that the divisions that are present in the culture are unfortunately mirrored in the evangelical church at large as well, as we all know. We're in a world of violence. We're in a world of misinformation. We're in a world of name-calling world of petty grievances, a lonely world, a fearful world, a world where those who have and those who have not are increasingly isolated from one another. We're in an addicted world. And when we look at all of that, uh, we can also see lots of organizations and NGOs and nonprofits and diplomats seeking to address a lot of those things. Everything from AI to racism, like we're working on it. But I'm asking a different question this morning. All of those things are, uh, in a, in, to speak watershed, they're all downstream problems, right? They're down here, but the question on the table this morning that I want to address is this. What's the upstream issue that's created a downstream Problem, And I would suggest to you that upstream, what we're facing that's creating all these downstream problems is a crisis of values. We're facing a crisis of values. Robert Bly wrote a book entitled um, Generation of Siblings, and the thesis of the book is we're finding ourselves in this moment in history because there's been this generational failure, the failure of one generation to either pass on the right values to the next generation or through passivity, not passing on any values at all, and therefore it's the values of the culture that end up shaping communities, and the values of the culture, as we know from Romans 12, are not intended to be the values of Christ's followers. We don't get to choose our own values. We're not free agents when it comes to value formation. People who have walked with God, while we're never perfect, if we remain on the journey, we remain on the journey because we hold certain values in common. And to the extent that those values are absorbed upstream, right, the values change the choices we make, everything. Our sexuality, our money, our time, our politics, our vote, our engagement with people who are different than us. Everything changes based on values, so we make different choices, and those choices change our behavior, and our behavior changes how we present to the world. And instead of the church being known as a petty, angry, hyper-political, power-hungry, divisive community, we can become known as people of love, joy, hope, peace, patience, mercy, kindness, generosity, justice, to the extent that we begin by changing our values. So we got to change our values. That's what I want to talk about this morning by looking at one man, David, in our ongoing series through the Scriptures, this is the man known after God's own heart, so to speak. And, and the thing about David that is significant that I focus on this morning is this. David gives us two values, which if we can kind of obsess over these values and make them real in our life, those values will change our, our choices. Those choices will change our behavior. That behavior will change how we present to one another into the world. Two values. Now, just because there's only two doesn't mean it's a shorter sermon. I'm going to warn you. 
there's uh, seven subpoints under each one. So just buckle in. Here we go. Two values. It, values are simple. David receives. David pauses. We could quit right there, but I want to show you the ways in which he receives, the ways in which he pauses. Let's look at this. David receives. First of all, when you look at the life of David, and most of you know who David is in the scriptures, the shepherd who became the king in the Old Testament, David receives, first of all, revelation from creation. Many of the Psalms he wrote had to do with exactly that, Psalm 19, Psalm 23, Psalm 104 being chief among them, though there are others. And it's there in the context for David as a shepherd, not just being in creation, but seeing creation as a revelation of God's character and seeing himself as part of creation. God uses David's receptivity of revelation from creation to transform him. Really, really important. Uh, David was a shepherd, so he's outdoors all the time. But all of us in the room, because this is Seattle, I'm guessing most of us in the room also are outdoors a fair bit. Like, we like being outside. However, the point isn't being out. I don't know, is it REI? Somebody says that. Get outside. Not the point. The point is to pay attention to what God is revealing through what God has made. Pay attention. You can be outside. I mean, I see people skiing all the time who are skiing but not paying attention to, to like the beauty of creation. I have been many times in my tenure here at Bethany uh, running Green Lake, too strong a word, jogging Green Lake. <laughs> I've been out, you know, circumnavigating Green Lake in some way and, and uh, deep into thoughts because I hate unresolved problems and you probably do too. So there's, there's a thing, it's marriage, it's work, it's finances, it's a health thing where the doctor said, hey, call me soon, whatever it is. And then you're running, but you're, but, and you're in creation, but you're not paying attention. Are you with me? And, and, and what David is teaching us is, hey, pay attention. I'll be r running, thinking, and then I'll see a group of people looking up. And only then will I stop and say, why are they all looking up? And then I'll look up and I'll see an eagle or I'll look down because everyone's looking down and I'll see, you know, a turtle or a heron or whatever it is. My encouragement to you is to pay attention to creation. And if you think this is some sort of optional luxury, it's very important that I remind you this morning that creation is God's first book in the Bible. God's character is revealed in creation. And those who pay close attention to creation in the Bible are, are shaped by the synergy of revelation from creation and, and the text. They, they work together to shape us to become more and more like Christ. When I, uh, as I was studying this, when I just began writing down moments of worship and creation for me, uh, without even trying, I had a list of 30 things, right? Just mo powerful moments. Uh, sunrise in the midst of migrating elk in North Cascades National Park. I'm standing right in the middle, thousands of elk uh, going around me and my young daughters on my, on my shoulders at the side of a man whose girlfriend was buried in an avalanche at Source Lake, and then, and then walking out with him and being present as he called the parents of the girl uh, who'd been killed in the avalanche, splitting wood every day, being in um, this little fire lookout called Park Butte up in the North Cascades. You look west and you see the San Juan Islands. You look north and you see Vancouver Island, all the way to Canada. The sun is setting over the islands. You look south and you see Mount Rainier. Mount Baker is right behind you, a half mile away. It's turning pink. And, and I'm with friends from all over the world and we begin praying each in our own language. I will never forget that moment. I, here's my encouragement. When you're out... Be out. Pay attention. Pay attention to the seasons, the cycles of the moon, the, 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 the flowers. Go smell the February Daphne that are now blooming right across the street in the little uh, entryway to the chapel. And it's not February. Why are they blooming? Because our climate is changing. Hello. Pay attention. Right? So we want to pay attention because uh, this is God's first book and it speaks to us. Both Tolkien and Lewis uh, were shaped by the devastation of creation in World War I 
And it was that devastation, the, 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 the scarred fields and burnt trees where nothing could grow that caused both Tolkien and Lewis to write as they did about the, the animals and the trees and the, and the beauty of creation because they understood that an industrial world that utterly insulates us from creation, well, well, it's not only bad for the earth, it's bad for your soul. David receives from creation. David receives a call to confront Goliath. The reason this is significant to me, this is the giant that David kills with five rocks, the famous story. What's significant is I so resonate with David receiving from creation and so do not, I do not resonate with David as a warrior. Does that make sense to you? Like, I'll sit and look at the stars all day, especially if there's good coffee nearby. But just don't ask me to have a hard conversation. Don't ask me to confront someone. Don't ask me to, to uh, you know, fight a battle. And what David teaches us is that our life is not ours for the making. Our life is ours for the opportunity to continually say yes to God as God brings our way things that we would never have chosen. Never have chosen. And David is willing to confront Goliath. I think that's beautiful. David receives his call to the crown also. Um, every morning I, I pray this prayer and this little, based on this little book I wrote called Forest Faith, Christ within me, I'm called. And I ask the question every morning, what am I called to today? What am I called to do? Every day, what am I called? What am I called? What am I called? David, uh, one of the reasons I love David is he didn't seek the crown. He didn't seek the big role. And I completely identify with that. I uh, was, as many of you know, perfectly happy living in the North Cascades on Highway 20 in a little town called Marble Mountain. My wife and I running outdoor stuff, teaching the Bible with torchbearers, traveling and teaching, having guests come in. Very similar life to the life we're now leading uh, two passes further south on I-90. But we were doing our thing, and then I came and spoke here. And then in the summer of 95, I'll never forget the moment, uh, the search committee from Bethany came up to the mountains, and uh, they're interviewing me. And they, they asked a question toward the end of the, the interview. They said, now, we're not saying that we're offering you a job here. But if we were to offer you a job, when can you start? That was the question. When can you start? I'll never forget, I just started to cry. I said, I don't want the job. We're we like it here. <laughs> they said, oh, yeah, 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 no, we know. When can you start? They go, yeah, no, no, no. I, we haven't decided to say yes even if you offer us the job. We're wrestling with God. And then this guy points his finger at me. That's exactly why we want you. Because you want what God wants, not what you want. Listen, uh, how many of you in the room are trying to write your own story? You know what I mean by that? Hey, just begin. You know, think big, big hairy goals. Begin with the end in mind and go after it, man. Not David. He, he receives what comes his way. He's the youngest brother, he's a shepherd, he's utterly unqualified, and yet he, this position is given him by God. I would say to you, one well, of the hardest days in the life of Richard and Donna Dahlstrom was the day we left Marble Mount and moved to the city of Seattle in December 1995. I sat and played piano in our living room and thought about all the people from all over the world who'd come to our ministry there and how desperately we did not want to go. And yet we knew that we knew that we knew God was calling us not to this, but to that. We had to let go and turn and go to a new thing. And it was the hardest day and it was the best day. Because without that day, I wouldn't be here now with you. God's story is always a better story. David knows that, so he receives. When it's time to confront, he confronts. When it's time to rise to the crown, he'll rise to the crown. David received correction as well. Hugely important. There's many instances, but I'll give you two. Nathan confronts David after he commits adultery and then has uh, the wife of the woman that he impregnated, excuse me, the husband of the woman he impregnated uh, killed 
It's adultery, it's deception, it's murder, it's abuse of power, and Nathan confronts him. Abigail confronts David uh, when David has this kind of lustful desire for revenge because an injustice has been done. And in both of these instances, when David is confronted, this is so significant, there's a receptivity to the hard word that he doesn't want to hear. We're listening for God's truth in the words we digest, both in the Bible and in our newsfeed, because we're humble enough to know that both these things, the Bible and the newsfeed, are open to being twisted and misused. So we receive from textual stuff and media with discernment. And can I just say to you, do the same with people in your life. You need people who say, the hard word. You absolutely do. Uh, during my tenure here as a senior leader, of course, I was accountable to a board. And I would just say to you, uh, at times, the board, members of the board, would pull me aside and say things I didn't want to hear. At times, staff members would pull me aside and say things I, want to hear, I didn't want to hear. In both instances, I'll just say this, super annoying. Like, no, I don't want to hear this. And it can be both annoying and valuable. Simple enough. But if we're unwilling to receive the hard word from people who love us, we end up insulating ourselves and all of us know that that's the world in which we live. And, and, and leadership is... is damaged and cultures are damaged and communities are damaged, organizations are damaged because people surround themselves with those who will only affirm them. I need desperately in my life truth tellers, but more than I need truth tellers, I need to receive it. And David receives. Here's the other thing I want to show you. David receives trials. He's anointed as king, and then there's immediately an attempt on his life by the existing king which leads to exile and living in caves. And then at the end of David's reign, his son steals the throne, and once again, David has run out of town. And so when you look at those two trials, beginning of his ministry, end of his ministry, <clears throat> at the beginning of his ministry, uh, the, he's suffering because of injustice. Uh, his, his predecessor refuses to yield the throne, right? Right? At the end of his life, he's suffering because of choices he made that led to a coup on the part of his son who stole the throne. And, and in both cases, here's what I want to show you. Uh, these are trials. Some because we live in a fallen world. Some because we make stupid choices, right? And I'll just pause and say that's your world. I don't know you. I don't have to. That's your world. Sometimes you're going to be a victim of injustice. Sometimes you're going to suffer because of choices you've made, words you've said, actions you've taken. But when you stir all of that together, here's the, one of the themes of the Bible. You will face trials. David did. Abraham did. Esther did. Jeremiah did. Paul did. Job did. You, you have. I have. You will. I will. It's the way of it. So, like, it's very helpful for me to get over the notion of uh, seeking kind of some formulaic uh, obedience plus intimacy plus, plus tithing plus devotions equals upward mobility and good health and long life. That's rubbish. And, and, and when trials come... For those of us who are trying to do these like things that come, I hope, from values, when trials come, then we're like this. Now I have not only the pain of my suffering, but this like secondary question, what have I done wrong that they're suffering? That's double anxiety. Like you're troubling yourself too much. Don't worry about it. You're suffering? Hello, you're human. You're suffering. So receive the trial. And then, you know, the good news is this. The good life is not defined in the scripture as, you know, obedience plus tithing plus prayer plus witness equals like this bomb-proof insular existence where you're always happy. That's just not true. 
What is true, Romans 8.29, is this. God is unconditionally, irrevocably, infinitely committed to your transformation, to you becoming more and more and more and more like Jesus. And Romans 8.28, which we love to quote, says this. Everything that happens in your life can contribute to your transformation. Everything. The good, the bad, the ugly. When you're rich, when you're poor, when you're healthy, when you're sick, when you're climbing the ladder in your org, when you're fired, when there's conflict in your marriage, when, when there's perfect intimacy, it's, God uses all of it. So then we kind of, our paradigm changes, and we're able to receive, God, whatever this day brings, I receive it from you. A little late this morning, woke up, go out to my little exterior office to check the pipes, turn the water on, no water comes out. I'm like, oh man, what a bummer. What if the toilet works? Flush the toilet and then the water just starts seeping into the room and it's this beautiful little minimalist cabin with no towels. So like I run into the house, you know, six in the morning, towels, leaky pipes, life, I hate my life. No, no I don't, not really. It's a thing, it's a thing that eventually won't even be there. God, what are you teaching me in this moment that'll contribute to my transformation? And everybody has moments. Just receive them from God, right? So I love that David receives. He's, he's kind of surrendered that illusion of control and he receives. Second, and equally significant, David pauses. One of the most important lessons we can learn as Christ followers is, is that... Our calling is not to follow a guidebook or philosophy or religious system. Our, in the end, our calling is to follow Christ. Dietrich Bonhoeffer taught me this. Ethics can't be kind of codified into a moral code. The question in every moment is, Christ, what are you asking of me in this moment? What do you want? And what's counterintuitive about that is we live in a very kind of linear, um, left brain kind of ordered, formulaic world. Give me a map, I'll go. Tell me what to do, I'll do it, right? And then in that world, we receive, react, receive, react, receive, react. And so we live in this world of action and reaction, and then that becomes our paradigm. And then along comes God through David, who wrote the Psalms, and he introduces this new word to us that's so significant and, li and little spoken of. It's the word selah, which means what? Does anyone know? Pause. It's all through the Psalms. Pause, 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 pause. Why? Because I receive, and then rather than reacting, I receive, I pause, I internalize, I listen. And when I hear from God, then I react. That's the way it's supposed to be. Between sti Victor Frankl says it this way, between stimulus and response, there's space. And in that space is our power to choose. And in our choice, in our response, lies our growth and our freedom. But you have to make the space. David does this. For example, David doesn't kill Saul, even though Saul was trying to kill him, the previous king. Saul knew that David had been promised a throne. Saul's ego was small, so addicted to power, unwilling to concede to his successor. So he tries to kill David. And in contrast, David has two opportunities to kill Saul, and in both cases refuses to do so because he fully believed that God's path would always and only be a path of receiving from God, not through violence earning, not a path of gaining by destroying the opposition. And for some, this led to a view that nonviolence is exactly what it means to be a Christ follower. That's called pacifism. For others, it led to a deep hesitancy to ever take matters into their own hands and fight, even if they're fighting for God. That's called just war theory. Either way, there's no room in the Jesus model for I'm offended, bam. It's just not on the table, right? I need to pause and ask God, God, you know, what is it that you're asking me in this moment? I will not resort to my own means. The Romanians did that, and they, they took down the dictator Ceausescu nonviolently because Ceausescu was going to arrest a pastor who was speaking about the idol of nationalism, ironically. And, and 
so he was going to be arrested. Tens of thousands of unarmed Catholic, Pentecostal, Baptist, Adventist, Orthodox Christ followers surround the house of the pastor who's going to be arrested. And they say, if you're going to jail him, you've got to jail all of us. If you're going to kill him, you've got to kill all of us. We're united. Not in our denomination, but in our belief that Jesus has spoken, we stand together nonviolently and change the world. What's your instinct when confronted or challenged? It's the question. And this is not only like macro political stuff. This is super practical. Uh, if you've been in my house, you know there's a counter between the kitchen and the dining area. If you visit, it's always neat and tidy. But if you come this afternoon unannounced, as some of you do sometimes, which is fine, by the way. <laughs> but anyway, you come in, and then uh, it's like it's a mess. And it's a mess, and 80% of the stuff, probably 90, is my stuff. And then my wife is tolerant, 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 and then, you know, I'll come home, and she'll say, what's up with the counter? I don't, we have this conversation weekly. There's s s goggles, ski goggles, ski gloves, sermons, Book proposals, two computers, phone charging cards. What's wrong with you? All this stuff belongs somewhere. Now, I could receive it, but here's my instinct. I'm immediately looking. What's her stuff on the counter? <laughs> oh, yeah, well, there's a pen. It's yours. <laughs> Deal with your own stuff. Hey, man, if you pause and receive be transformed. Radical. And then, because David pauses, he doesn't build a temple, even though he wants to. He's conquered all his enemies, you know, he's ready to do the next thing, and in his mind, the next thing is a temple. God says no. All through the scriptures, there are people who want to do stuff for God, and God says no. Don't do it. I don't need your help. Relax. The need doesn't constitute the call. You do what I'm calling you to do. David, you want to build? God says no, so David doesn't build. Joshua, oh, you ready to go into battle? No, I want you to wait a week. So they wait a week. Oh, Paul, you ready to go out and preach to the Jews? God says, wait, go make tents. So he goes and makes tents for 14 years. And then is sent out not to the Jews, but the Gentiles. Hear me. You're the temple, God's building you, but God's the builder and the architect. You're the worker, receiving and pausing and saying yes. Then David doesn't retaliate when it would have been tempting to do so. At the end of his ministry, Absalom, his son, steals the throne from him. David's being run, literally run out of town, and there's a guy from his predecessor's family who's still bitter that Saul isn't still king. You know, he's dead. And as David's being run out, this guy Shimei from Saul's house, he starts chasing David, cursing David, throwing rocks at David, saying to David, ha, ah, finally, get out of town, you murderer, you scandal. God is now repaying you for all the blood you shed on the household of Saul. Is it true? No, it's all lies. It's, it's, it's bitterness, it's vitriol, it's, it's lies, it's rooted in anger and a lust for vengeance. And so David's assistant says, hey, just say the word, I'll go cut off his head. Problem solved. And then David says, oh, no, you won't. What if the Lord said to him, curse David? David said, my son is trying to kill me. How much more would the Benjamin's household want to kill me? Let him alone. Let him curse. The Lord has told him. How do you do receiving um, information that maligns your character? Like, how do you do? How do you do when you're the blunt end of gossip? How do you do when you walk into the hallway after a meeting and there's people talking and then they see you and they stop talking? How do you do? I embedded in David's kind of non-response here is his belief in the sovereignty of God. God gave me the throne. God took the throne. Maybe God gives the throne back. It's not my job. 
My job is to receive what God is give, giving me and, and, and allow what God is giving me to, 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 to shape me, right? Man, don't cling, friends, to money, power, prestige, plans, position, pleasures. Why? Because Ecclesiastes 1, it's all passing away anyway. Doesn't matter. I was kind of awake in the night, Tuesday night, worrying about some stuff. And there's a very clear word from God. Hey, Richard, stop. Listen to me and release what I tell you to release. You do not need to be performing in order to earn love. I love you already. Wow. So, you know, we conclude this this way. David's far from perfect. He's a mess. But what's so cool about David is the receptivity and the pause. When uh, Saul was a mess and confronted, the response was just defensiveness and a kind of clinging to power. And because of that, his journey with God stopped. When David was confronted, he wrote Psalm 51, which is this confession of his sin and this declaration, God, you know what? If you took everything from me right now, you'd be perfectly just in doing so. So I don't pray for justice, God. I pray for mercy. I pray for forgiveness. I pray that I continue to walk in your story. I pray that you continue to shape me so that the joy of my salvation can once again be evident in my life. That's my prayer. Like receptivity and pause. If those are your values, you're in God's story, I assure you. Don't know how hard it is, but I know that you're in God's story. Let's pray. Father, we want to be in your story. Our desire is to be people shaped by receptivity and people who pause because truly, though there's a time for everything, we don't know what time it is. We don't know when is the time to speak, the time to be silent, the time to take up the, the, the sword, the time to lay the sword down, the time uh, to turn over the tables, the time to turn the other cheek. We don't know, but you do. And so it would shape us, Jesus, to be people of receptivity and people of pausing, knowing that it was just with those two values, you will shape us to be people of hope in the world, and we'll thank you for it. Praying in Christ's name, amen. Mm-hmm.